any of us, any of you, or anyone who's even, um, to any extent, considers himself a Wagnerian or a Wagner lover. And if we're saying, what is the salient, what is the most important, what is the most obvious uh, principal feature of the music in the ring, what would they answer? Uh, what okay. well, I'm okay. Well, tonight I'm going to try to talk about the music in the ring and not talk about my piece. I'll talk about my piece tomorrow, and I'll even talk about them tonight, but I'll try not to talk about them tonight. Um, I, I think there is a very good reason not to talk about my piece in the ring. Um, and that, well, there's more than one good reason. But one reason is, is that by talking about light motifs and only talking about light motifs, we run into the danger of playing a game and hearing the music as if it was some kind of an artificial patchwork and forgetting what the music is really doing. The light motifs are a technique, are a means to an end, a means to actually quite a few different ends, not just a single end. And um, by engaging in various games with light motifs, trying to list them all, or name them all, or find them all, or then find out they're all related, all of which are great games, and games that I play with, with enormous satisfaction many times. Nevertheless, they are games that have a danger of losing uh, the goal, which is a deeper and better appreciation and understanding of the music of the ring, the volume. And I'm not really talking specifically about the ring, because I'm breaking my rule already. The line of in the ring are different than they are in any of these other works. They have a different kind of reality, a different kind of function, a different kind of use. Um, so what I'm going to talk about tonight, in both of my talks, until uh, today and tomorrow, and Sunday I'll talk only specifically on Rival, in spite of the list of questions you have or not, but I'm going to stick to Rival on Sunday. But uh, tonight and tomorrow, I'm going to be talking very much as an introduction to the brain. So all this is going to... I will try to maybe give my examples to uh, emphasize Rival, because we're going to be hearing Rival tomorrow Question. afternoon, Question. and because I think it serves very well the purpose. And I'd like to start, sort of as an introduction, to leapfrog onto what Simon was speaking about before dinner, and this period of Wagner's famous five years of uh, inactivity musically of the period of his three major essays. There actually is a very important fourth essay in this period, from a musical standpoint, very important. I've been titled on my phone, uh, Communication with My Friends. Uh, yes, that's what it's a fifth also. So it's a very, very busy period, actually, for writing. Um, and um, he sort of, in a way, he reminds me, you know, in the comic strips, when there's somebody going to do something, and how he always stands in place and reps and reps and reps, his feet keep going faster and faster and faster, and when he finally moves, it's like an explosion. I always get that kind of feeling, and he's revving his engines. I think, and I, I know that Simon agrees with me with this, um, and I, it, it, but it, would, it weakened his argument too much to have said so too clearly, although he really kind of did say it. It's very, very dangerous. It's very, very important, very important, essentially important, to understand what Wagner was saying, doing, re re against what he was um, rebelling in this period of great essays. Um, it's very important to understand what his intentions are and what he's trying not to be, because as all revolutionaries typically do, he's really very often defining himself by what he's not going to be. This is especially true, perhaps, in the music. Maybe more, more true in the music than in, in the dramatic aspects. I don't know. Um, but I think it's also very important for us to remember that these are not descriptions of the ring. There's a rather significant book, which actually uh, Ari may have here, Jack Stein. You have that in the Fusion of the Arts? Okay, I don't have that book. Okay. And Jack Stein, I think, makes a colossal mistake, which in a way discredits the whole book, although it does contain interesting material. Because he basically critiques the ring as, as in all ways it fails Wagner's theories. And he can point out all the places where he, Wagner doesn't do what he says he's going to do. And he's making this very basic error of confusing theoretical essays and works of art. Theoretical essays and works of art are entirely different things. They actually perhaps come from different parts of the human brain or the human psyche. Uh, Wagner needed to write these works. He had to write these works. He was lucky enough or had enough genius or 
our circumstances, we're lucky enough that he took the time off to be away from his creative work, to write these uh, very, very important works. He clears the air for himself. He sort of redefines his direction as an artist. But they are not blueprints for the rain. Um, musically speaking, they are blueprints to, for most of that's wrong with and, that, and that's all. Now, there are a lot of reasons why they're not blueprints. Uh, but just one, which probably should be left for next, next year's talk, but I think it's worth all saying, in the context of all the other things that we're going to be saying, is, is that, um, of course, Wagner, central to Wagner's essays is the idea of the union of the arts, the absolute equality of the arts, and this very important principle, he says, which, is, which I'm going to build on, which he says that uh, in, in, in opera of today, he says, that music and, and drama have taken exactly opposite roles. That music has is, is become a, a means, music has become the end when it should be the means, and theater has become a means when it should be the end. And he says it should be exactly the opposite. And that's a very, very important principle. However, um, it's not a principle that Wagner ever lives up to, except perhaps in much, not all, much of Das uh, Certainly by the first act of Wagner, Wagner has left this principle. And of course, uh, by the end of his life, by Parsifal, he is really left it behind. And uh, in that, the music has become more and more, I won't say important, but I'll say, uh, takes up more and more space in the context of the drama. There is more and more music to the amount of words that are spoken, to the amount of dramatic action that is being done. There is very little dramatic action in some cases, and a great deal of music. And this, this contradicts in a very simple way the basic, the basic premise. Music has become very much an end in itself. There's no, you, you, you know, you, you say what you will, it has. It has already an act one of Duval Cura. Um, it could be, many people would argue, I would argue, that most of the greatest music in Das Reigel, not all, most, is in the or, uh, orchestral interludes. Mm -hmm. And the orchestral interludes end up telling us more about the characters, about their situations, about the emotions, about what it all means than the characters themselves do, which would be a terrible contradiction of Wagner's whole theory. Um, Wagner, however, was very lucky, because the same year he began this uh, Die Valkyrie, he read Schopenhauer. And in Schopenhauer, he recognized the justification for what he already felt. Schopenhauer, and he says that Schopenhauer taught him to recognize what he already knew, but had not yet recognized. In other words, Schopenhauer was not new, it didn't change him. That's how he justified not changing the text of the rain. He said, it was already right. I just didn't understand it properly. And Schopenhauer opened my eyes to myself. And Schopenhauer has a very important thing to say about the arts, which is that music is by far the superior art. As far as Schopenhauer is concerned, all the other arts are slaves to convention and to the human mind. And only music can directly express the will. I'm not at all competent to speak on Schopenhauer. And I'm not going to. Uh, should read the Wagner uh, and the Vlog. The book he's book is pretty good on that, I think. Um, and, and what little I know is mostly for McGee's work. Although I, Schopenhauer is actually kind of readable. I find Feuerbach to be very difficult to read, and Hegel to be utterly unreadable. But Schopenhauer, even I can kind of get through So, And of course, as, as a musician, I like the fact, one thing about this, Schopenhauer's favorite composer, by the way, was Rossini, which is interesting in the light of what you were saying. But nevertheless, Schopenhauer does think that music is. Uh, and, and, and so, this is not in any way to lessen the importance of this enormously uh, significant soul-searching that Wagner had gone through during this five-year period. It's only that it has to be viewed um, as a part of the creative process, as a preparation for the creative process, not as a blueprint or as a description of the work of art that follows. I, mean, I think you would agree with that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, um, that being said, much of Das Reinhold, in many aspects, very carefully, uh, follows things that he's musically that he says he's going to do. Musical techniques which he is not so much invented as sort of posited uh, as means to, to create this absolute union of uh, music and drama, action, word, sound, idea, set, scene, everything, all the arts together. Before I get into the uh, ideas of how music works in the ring, um, I th I think in the context of this background of Wagner's essays, I'd like to say, we were talking about the, the um, dramatic, his critique of what theater was like, what opera was like. I'd like to give a little bit more detail in his critique about the problem of music 
in his time, and especially the problem of music in opera. Because Wagner is mostly concerned, really, with opera, with the world of opera, or as he becomes music drama. Um, Wagner's hero as a musician, as an opera composer in a way, his hero was Weber. But Wagner has a very problematic um, relationship with Weber. He admires him, he's German, he sort of creates German romantic opera, he contains elements that Wagner very much admires and, and, and even um, aspires to himself. And yet Weber is by no means his idea of an ideal musician. But there is one who really was his ideal or ideal musician, and that's Beethoven. Wagner has an absolutely <coughs> limitless reference for Beethoven. And in, in perhaps his best essay, quite a late one, 1870, is his essay on Beethoven. The two essays of Wagner's which are the best are his essay on Beethoven and his essay on conducting. And they're both from 1870, right at the time when he started to write the ring again. It's interesting, the same kind of period, really, this sort of uh, format. Anyway, um, and what Wagner complained about opera music was basically this, that the music in opera, the, the reasons for it was because it was either intended for the voice or intended to sell tickets, respect for all the reasons that Simon was giving us. But that it was music that was a slave to exterior circumstances. It had to fit the singer's voices, it had to fit the forms that were conventional to opera. If you had you had a slow thing and then there had to be a chorus to come in and, and have three or four words and then you would stand up and send the cabaletta and that had to be fast and brilliant even if you were dying and then people could interpose and they did. One aria for another aria if you didn't like you know, uh, if you didn't like this aria from this opera, you could interpose another aria from another opera in that place with the same words and everything. Nobody, nobody minded. It was all fine because it was all so completely without a sense of the situation. In other words, the music was entirely undramatic. It was undramatic music. It was music that was being imposed not by the necessity of the drama, not by the needs of what the characters were saying or the situations in which they found themselves but rather by the conventions of, of the operatic world, by the needs for spectacle and grand opera, by the needs to wow the public, to, to, to sell lots of tickets. Robert Lillian, the most successful opera ever written, period, if we view it strictly as a commercial enterprise. Um, Robert Lillian is Meyer Beer's big tour of force. The, 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 the high point in the history of opera, if we look at it from a commercial standpoint, is the scene when Robert Lillian, who's a diabolical figure, a necromancer, the great uh, the film of today, raises from the dead a bunch of nuns, sinful nuns, who do a ballet on skates. And this was considered to be the highest point of theater, imagine, um, in 1831. So, um, so Wagner says is that the music is not allowed to, 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 be, to, to give expression to anything, really, because it's forced to either be an expression of these uh, artificial constraints of theater, or of the needs for singers to display their voices, or of the, um, the all the conventions that had taken over, which were there just because they were there, the, the conventionality. The complaining about conventions, of course, is something that artists have done from time to memorial, artists of a certain time. It's worth noting that Wagner was a um, enormous fan of Mozart's, some of Mozart's operas, the great ones, and um, many of this, these same conventions exist in Mozart operas. But as Wagner points out, in Mozart, it somehow doesn't matter. The, um, uh, whereas in, in Bellini and, and, and in Rossini and Donizetti, it does, or did, or did to, to Wagner. So the problem number one, music is being forced to um, fit itself into a, a role which doesn't allow it to be free and doesn't allow it to express uh, its dramatic character. It cannot express the, the feelings of the, um, of, the person, of the characters or the certain situation or the text in any way. Or, or it, 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 it's, it's being forced to do things that it doesn't do very well and it doesn't mean very much. And the music itself is not the best kind of music. And this is a very important part. And I think the first part is easier to understand and more readily understood than the second part. The first part, in other words, that the music in opera, as he found it, is not dramatic enough. It does not really fit dramatic needs. I think we all understand this. But the idea that music is not good enough, that it's not the, the good kind of music, it is not powerful, cohesive, uh, 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 um, organically fused music. And Wagner had a very clear idea about what is good music. Good music, the best music, is Beethoven. 
Beethoven was the greatest composer. This is the best music. And why is Beethoven the best music? Wagner goes into this. And because Beethoven, more than any other composer, is able to take from small bits of musical material and create vast, far-flung creations where these small amounts of material take on huge significance to the listener, take on a life of their own, interrelate, weave this wonderful tapestry of sound, which in the end uh, uh, comes together and creates a great living, dynamic work. Wagner's, this is the greatest music. So Wagner has a double goal. To make music which is completely, entirely dramatic in its nature, which expresses the character's inner life, their feelings, uh, the situation in which they are, the significance of the work from an outside source, we'll talk about it sometimes quite from an outside source, but at the same time, that was in some way a manifestation in dramatic sense of what is the best music. In other words, take what Beethoven does in his great symphonies and string quartets and somehow translate it, transpose it into a way that uh, would, would keep the greatness of the music and yet make it appropriate for drama. Make music dramatic and make the music, dramatic music great. That's, that's sort of kind of a, it's kind of a two-way street. I think that the, the second idea um, is perhaps more difficult to grasp than the first idea. Um, maybe it takes a little more thinking about. Um, now obviously, this is gonna be my last, no it's not, but um, this is, I, I, I was gonna say comment about light motifs, but of course I'll mention them. Obviously, to some extent, the light motif is the answer to both of these two things. Um, since the light motif, the idea of the light motif is, is that it represents something in the music, some dramatic aspect of the music, or some dramatic aspect, in musical terms, it is a musical manifestation of something uh, in the drama. And at the same time, by its nature, especially as Wagner conceived it, as these plastic uh, uh, war motif, as these, these basic natural motives, that they could uh, manifest themselves in many ways and have interact with each other and undergo the kind of development and, and growth and um, that, that motifs and themes do in Beethoven, or actually not just Beethoven, but Beethoven would be for him sort of the highest point. He was going to build on Beethoven, and he would be greater than Beethoven, and more modern, more essential than Beethoven. Beethoven was the greatest composer, and in his own way, unbeatable, and yet Wagner was going to go further because he was going to take Beethoven and turn it into the theater and have a complete work of art, uh, which would feature music of, of the <coughs> analogous power and, and, and range and emotional depth that Beethoven had been able to find. All right, so let's look now at what music does in the right. Um, and not talk about light movies for a while. Some of the things are very obvious, and some of the things are less obvious. And I'll try to, um, since this is this year, I uniquely hooked up to a portable microphone. This, we're getting so high tech here, it's like, it's like unbelievable. Who would have thought it? I mean, no. Um, usually I have to shout from the camera. I don't even have to do that anymore. Um, I will illustrate these things. I'll probably be moving over there very shortly. You all have this functions of music, right? No. no. If you have that black thing, it's in there. Right, found it? Mm -hmm. Not yet. I'll give you another second. Anyway, I divide very arbitrarily the function of music in the ring. The function of music, some, some of these in all of us, even even Meyer and even uh, uh, Bellini, um, into three different kind of categories. You? No, okay. Jackie. Jackie, I think somebody's. I can't give you mine. <laughs> okay, so the first group is music as descriptive. And before we go into this, I want to point something out, which is probably uh, uh, very trivial, but nevertheless worth pointing out. We, we often talk about descriptive music, and uh, we, the music that's like, and, and, and if I say depiction of the setting, continuous, we immediately can think of, by continuous, I mean it's ongoing, lasts for a few pages or maybe even a whole scene. We need to think of the Rhyme Man scene. I'll place that in a second, but 
you know, it sounds like water. We can hear this whole scene is, is, is taking place in the water. Or Wagner is uh, evoking water. Or, or the, the Force Pillars, the Force scene, the whole scene with Siegfried in Act Two uh, uh, of Siegfried, when he's in the Force, I mean, he's evoking the Force. And he does so in a more or less continuous manner. Now, um, Wagner does this more than any opera composer had done before, but there's some of this in other opera. Now, um, especially, I would say, in Weber. Um, it's very much a, a, a romantic interest to depict the setting as na a natural setting. The, the, the idea of the importance of nature, which of course is very central in the ring, and more central in the ring than any of other Wagner's works by far, actually, only parts of all a little bit as nature is a major a player, but you know, nature is a very major player in the ring, and indeed, some ring productions have, have actually the Seattle one, although I didn't see it, so I really shouldn't speak, but from what I understand, that's sort of the central player. And certainly, um, Thoreau, not Thoreau, Russo, and the idea of the, uh, the, the return to a natural state has some elements in Wagner, certainly. Um, and, and in general, romanticism is, is about nature. Nature is a sort of mystical, unifying force that, that matters needs to come uh, in union with it. It's part of him and get outside of him, all these things. Um, so anyway, let's move. Obviously, okay. So if we're talking about, this, this is going to all seem very simple once for a while. Then it'll get a little bit more complicated. Okay, if he wants, music to, if he wants it to sound like water. Of course, music can't sound like water. It doesn't sound a bit like water. It doesn't sound a bit like forest. It doesn't sound a bit like fire. It doesn't sound a bit like any of these things. The, 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 the storm at the beginning of uh, Flying Dutchman doesn't really sound like a storm at sea. But it does a damn good job of evoking it. And in a way, it does it perhaps better. In other words, I personally find listening to the forest murmurs, or listening to the storm at sea in Flying Dutchman even, or uh, much more evo evocative of the feelings that are summoned up to me by being in the forest, or by being in a storm at sea, um, or by listening to the water run, than actually just having the water. If, if, the, if, the, if instead of starting with the prelude of Das Rangel, if we just had the sound of, of, of rushing water for the whole first uh, scene, it would be far less effective as it happens. I mean, just as, as scene painting. So I think we have to grant that there's something to this, the music's ability to paint scenes, even though it doesn't do it in any kind of real way. It doesn't, if a painter who paints a picture of a waterfall, it looks like a waterfall. A musician who writes a piece about a waterfall, it doesn't sound in the slightest like a waterfall. But somehow or another, partly by convention, partly by other techniques, it certainly evokes to us the feelings we get about a waterfall. But it's very interesting, actually, if we take the prelude of, that's right, um, you know, stars. Water or the Rhine or anything. We am I too loud? Okay. Wasn't even E flat. I was just just I was just now my last gig uh, ten days ago was in the Italian city of La Spezia, and La Spezia is where Wagner says in my Leben that he had the original idea of the Prelude of Das Rheingold. That he missed his connection. He came in by boat and was catching a train. He missed the connection, something which still happens, and spent the night at the hotel station, which doesn't ex the station hotel, which doesn't exist anymore. But there's a plaque where it used to be. And he, and he uh, didn't sleep, sort of was in a state between wake and sleep, and he said he was this, enveloped by this ever-changing but never-changing E-flat major chord. And when he, when he finally really woke up, he realized that this was his beginning of Das Rheingold. So, there you go. That's, it's actually a pilgrimage place. Someday, somebody's going to pay for a, me to organize a trip to Italy to all the Wagner pilgrimage places. It's actually quite interesting. I'm planting a seed here. <laughs> so, then a little bit later, so, you know, for the, for the longest time, for 54 measures, actually, it's just, you know, those the horns. So playing this, this, this chord over and over. Then it finally... That sounds a little bit more like water, but it doesn't really sound like water until maybe when you get. It's going. And I guess more than anything else, 
the way it suggests water, at least at the beginning, is just by the, the continuity of motion. Now, already, Wagner is making a very basic statement about the nature of music in the ring, which is going to be different from any other opera that's ever been written, um, which is that um, even in his own, well, Flying Dutchman, but Flying Dutchman, he starts off, certainly, by evoking this, the sea and this, the storm at the sea. But then he goes on into other things because it's organized by an, an exterior music form. The Flying Dutchman or Overture is, is really basically follows a kind of, of, of musical form which exists outside of the content. But Wagner is not going to leave this alone, this, this, movement, this movement in 16th notes, this, this, this moving water, for this entire scene. It's going to continue. And the, the music is going to be placed on top of it. It's not, it, it, for the, the, the prelude, it's all it is. The content is just the water. For the rest of the scene, it's not just the water, but this water, even like when they first start singing. It, the water is still underneath. And even this, which singing is just one extra note that he's added into the, but it's still, the, 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 the liniments, it's the same basic music. It's just sort of been filled out melodically to some extent. Um, so that, this is a very good and important example of the way Wagner uses music to paint the scene. Um, another completely different way that he uses music to paint the scene, and, and also an exterior factor, maybe, is what about... Nobody can tell me? Oh, come on. Sure you can. It's in the Erda. Um, it's some of Erda's music, but it's not actually... Erda is referred to in that music. No, it's not... Okay, I should... Maybe, maybe I've tricked you. It's not from Rheingold. It's in the ring, but not in Rheingold. Play it one more time. I don't want to play guessing games, but... Stop in the scene. It's always in the background. It's the Norn scene mm. of the beginning of, of the beginning of Gutter um, Now, again, it, I, it's harder to say. But one thing it suggests is that the, there's this rope that they're weaving. Uh, um, it suggests a lot of things, actually, because by this time the music in the ring is so overlaid with uh, associations and things that we we hear a lot of things in this music. But nevertheless, it's definitely the whole scene is painted by this this effect. Of course, a much more famous one, what if I play? <laughs> yeah, Siegfried's Forest one is good. This not one of the more successful parts. Um, by the way, and, and not this very successful part musically, not, not on the piano. Although I play all the time and it doesn't really work too well. Um, none of these, by the way, in a certain kind of way, these are the more, most difficult kinds of things to play in, in the ring on the piano, precisely because they depend so much upon sound color, upon the actual, not, not the notes or the content of the music, but the way it sounds. And of course it doesn't sound the same in the piano as it does in, in the orchestra. One just little interesting note, um, how Wagner repeats himself. He, just as in um, the big prelude of Das Rheingold, he starts... fills out. Um, he does the same kind of thing with, with the forest murmurs. The first time we hear the music, it's actually... Very, you know, just in... Uh... Exactly the same music played twice as fast, but in general, the whole atmosphere changes uh, a lot. In that case, it changes a third time after Siegfried tastes the blood of the dragon. It changes again, and maybe we'll talk about it when we get to, to Siegfried. Actually, I can talk about it later in this in this 
because that doesn't reflect anymore uh, 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 scene painting. But these are, these are all examples, and there's lots of them in the ring, where um, Wagner paints, um, the, paints the, 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 uh, the external scene of the, the setting in sort of a long, sometimes he does it in slightly more subtle ways. I'll give one more example of a different type, which is again not from Rheingold, but actually from Yvonne Cura. And that would be this place. You know, when uh, Sigmund and Sieglinde, uh, they're just sort of getting, getting starting to warm up, as it were, uh, and um, the, the door abruptly opens, it's like, I guess, a wind, yeah. a wind current, the door opens, and, and uh, the moon is shining, it's been stormy, but now it's cleared up, and the moon is shining, and this is, in some productions, would be rather a hokey moment, but of course, it shouldn't be anything but, I mean, it's, you know, they, theoretically, they run outside and say, you know, the spring has come, and it starts, it, it begins, he sings the spring song, etc. But what, in the music we hear, passage that kind of comes out of nowhere. Um, but, and, and that certainly is very definitely, again, descriptive tone painting. I don't, it seems radiant and peaceful and, and, and um, with this kind of movement. But of course there, there's a subtext, which is still external, because this is which is the storm that began the piece, has now been Transform. The storm has been transformed <clears throat> into this radiant, peaceful, magical, moonlit scene. So it's again, but this is just this is tone painting. So one of the functions of music in the in the, the ring is 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 almost you could say is parallel to the stage design. The stage, the, 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 the just the design of the stage, the actual external how it looks like. The the one of the big problems of staging the ring actually is that Wagner is so extraordinarily successful. At, at suggesting a forest, or suggesting the bottom of the Rhine, or suggesting a moonlit spring night after a storm, um, that uh, it's very difficult for even the, the greatest directors to, to do anything which is not just disappointing compared to music. Um, uh, and so what would, would be an argument, playing devil's advocate here, to avoid any kind of realistic you know, in the earliest productions, they did try to have as realistic as possible. But the problem is, is it isn't it even better than just to shut your eyes and listen to the music? I myself have never seen a forest murmurs where I don't listen to it all with my eyes shut because it's much more evocative to me as music than that is anything that anybody could do at the stage. So maybe they shouldn't even try. That would be Violon's point, I suppose, to say the best thing is not to try to to represent that aspect of it. But that's that that's your domain. I'll let you talk. <laughs> Okay, so let's go down to, to A, to the next part, which is description of an event. This is a little bit more um, limited, but, but this can be quite important. When something very, very exciting or important or um, dramatic moment in the ring happens, something happens in the music which describes it. Um, the, the, uh, let's see if I can find a very obvious one. Would be in Dust Rhyme. Oh God, I took the wrong score of this Rhyme. The one that I've cut up to pieces. So that's not going to make things easier for me, but still. Okay, when, Al, when, when Wotan grabs the ring from Alberic, we hear. Interestingly enough, it mirrors almost exactly a parallel event, which is probably also torn out of the score. <laughs> Too bad. I also probably need to get my glasses. And that's the moment when Alberic steals the ring. Um, it's, it's, it's highly significant, highly um, proper, that the music when Wotan takes the ring from Alberic should mirror the music when Alberic takes the ring. Let's listen to the music when Alberic takes the ring. We'll hear something else first, but the actual event itself. That's the moment, okay? A lot of other stuff. 
goes that goes on, but it's very much a sort of a very loud uh, uh, chord that has percussion on it, and then we have a, a distorted version of, of that. Which I'm not going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about light motifs, <laughs> at least not right now. But anyway, the, the two the two moments marry each other. That's going to be another one of the major functions of music in the ring, which you haven't gotten to yet. But it so happens that this this is music that describes an event. There are lots of events, single events in the ring. The ring doesn't have as many individual events as some things do, and you have to wait a while for them sometimes, which makes them more powerful when they arrive. For instance, but an event like the death of Siegmund, or the um, Albert kissing the ring, it's very special music, when Albert kisses the ring, it goes this way. And um, so, independently of whatever that might have motivically, it's also it's, it, it, it's descriptive in a way. It sounds very baleful, and there's a big percussive sound, and it kisses the ring, and it's very you know, it's so it's it's music. In other words, sort of signals, underlines, defines, describes the, the uh, events. Um, I think in Derek Cook's book, he actually um, it takes Rheingold and uh, um, reduces the story to 28 single events. And what's really interesting about that list is that only six of them occur as events in any, myth any mythology. The other 22 are all invented by Wagner, um, which of course furthers what you said about Wagner stole from all the mythologies and then wrote his own story on it. Um, each of these events has a certain music, well, almost each of them, that would, would describe that event. That's not the most important function of music in the ring, but it is one. Okay, so let's go down to 1B. This, of course, is a much more important one. Description of stage action, its emotions, thoughts. In other words, not, not, not anymore describing the setting, but describing what's going on in the setting. Now, in a way, this is, this, this is happening all the time. Um, um, and again, maybe the best examples don't come from Das Rheingold. But, okay, I'll give you one from Das Rheingold. I was going to actually immediately give you one from... Uh, um, there's so many from uh, Valkyra, which is probably the easiest. But let, let's take a, a moment in Das Rheingold, which is one of the uh, early sort of triumphs, I would say, of Wagner's new form. And this is the place where um, Lo Loga has just told everybody about the um, ring, that Al Albert has forged this ring, and um, so Loga's finishing his bit. music that we heard in the first scene. It's sort of slightly changed, but stuff from the, he's talking about the Rhine Maidens, he's talking about the, this, the, this, this ring that Albrecht has made, and it, it just follows what he's saying. associate with Wotan because of other music which he has. It's the harmony's gotten much more bizarre. I mean from now it's and now Fricka says, boy if I had the ring, I would look so great that Wotan would never leave home. change in the, in the music. It just goes, flies right, right off. And then, um, when, uh, this, is, this is truly one of the great uh, places, uh, not in, it's a, it's a great use of motives too as it happens, but it's independent of that. Just after this, um, Loga is playing up on Wotan and Fricka's desire for this ring. And so we hear, don't forget that the, the idea was of course to, to, um, to pay for Freya, but Freya is getting far away. We hear sort of Freya in the background of this. Fricka, 
and each in their own way are becoming consumed with the desire to have the ring. That's not me. Wow. Um, the, 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 that, so the music here is, is not just painting the, uh, the emotional states of the, the characters, but we can see as the music changes, as the, as the emotional states of the characters change. Now I was going to use a very obvious example from of the, one, the first act of, of Die Valkyra for this, for instance, that when Zygmunt and Sieglinda first sort of look at each other and say, hey, you know, we hear... famous solo cello. And we hear perhaps sort of the sound of the solo cello, which is very uh, small, but very, very intense. It's up high, lots of vibrato. Um, we hear the sort of rapt sense of sort of wonder and surprise, and time has stopped in a way. But later on, we hear the same music, for instance, on very passionate and makes them get more and they're really they're, they're waiting for the curtain to come down so they can do what they want to do uh, um, and in some productions they don't wait for the curtain to come down which is, which is probably pretty accurate too um, but the, okay so the, again the music is depicting not just an emotional state it depicts it in the way it depicts it now Wagner in by the way in his book goes into great detail how the music depicts it he actually defines why this is a very good, a very good way to depict um, emotion, something like falling in love in music. And just to give you a very, very quick sort of oversimplified version of how he does that, he do, because he would say in that chord there is tension. It's not a pleasant chord by itself necessarily, because it's it's in a state of unrest musically. But Now that also is in a state of unrest. We couldn't stop the piece there. It has to go on to something else. But it's gone from one state of sort of exquisite tension to another state of, 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 less ex, of still exquisite but less tension. And this constant sense of this uh, tension which is sort of resolved and then sort of resolved is in his theories in opera drama, uh, the way that music can express a, a complex emotional uh, states. And he, he gives a very simple, he says, you know, he gives us a completely um, sort of uh, consonant, let's say, musical sense. In other words, no tension. If someone says, you know, I am um, uh, spring brings um, sp spring uh, brings happiness, and then he has another phrase where it says, death brings sadness, and it's this phrase is all dark and not mine. No. Dark minor music. Then he says, "Love brings the deepest sorrow with the greatest joy." And and, and that would be that he, he, would, he hadn't written this yet, or maybe he had thought of it, but hadn't written it. Uh, um, and so the idea of this, this the combination of this, uh, uh, the, the two modes. So it, it does manifest itself in his theories to some extent, um, and, 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 and the, in the clearest forms, perhaps in, in, in writing. Okay, so that's. Description of emotional content of a scene. And the continuous, okay, for instance, as it's, it's continuous because we see as its projection, as it's going from one state to another state, as it, the perfect example again would be in, in, um, um, Ryan, in, uh, in the love scene the, in, in Act One of Valkyra, where as they get more and more passionate, it changes character. But also we saw that in Rheingold, as the same music that is taken over from Loga's narration, which is actually in its in its turn taken over from the first scene, mostly of, of, of that's Rheingold, you know, the, with Alberic and the Rhine Maidens, becomes more and more sort of uh, fraught with both tension and desire and then uh, magic as they become under the spell of the ring. And we really hear it. I mean, he, he, we hear it with lots of little orchestral things, very subtle use of percussion, all sorts of little things. But the fact is that we do hear it. And the function of the music is to make us hear it in a way that um, um, the words themselves or the action themselves uh, cannot or don't. Okay, so now, description of the content of character speech. Now this is something, actually, which I was already talking about, but it can be very localized. If, if we actually just even follow 
any time. There's really no sense even in giving an example. If we take almost anybody's speech, Wotan's monologue, but even something as early as the first scene of The Ring, of Alberich talking to the, to the Rhine maids, as they answer him, you know, the music will change. If I just almost at random take something, the, 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 the um, as, as he says, not easy stuff to play, but um, he's saying, your slender arms can fling around me that I may touch thee and toy with thy tresses. With passionate heat while my bosom so soft, let me press myself. And you know, the, 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 the harmonic content, the, the, the sound of the music. That, is, that, that, that change with the content of his words. This, by the way, is completely new. Um, the first time Wagner ever starts experimenting with this in opera is, anybody want to guess what's the first time we traditionally say that Wagner tries to write a music that actually changes all the time with the emotional content of the characters? It's almost word by word. Which, is, which, which, which would seem to negate any possibility of having a long line or a melody or, or any kind of a form. If the music is constantly changing, with this is a big challenge for Wagner. If the music changes um, with every emotion, with every significance of the word, it would seem like it would be a very chaotic state of affairs. It would be a little bit like um, those scenes in Ulysses, for instance, or even more in Finnegan's Wake, where the words are just free associating as they go along. And it would seem like that the music would, would, would be like that. It's not, because he never quite really does that. But the effect, the first place that Wagner sort of does that, where he's, where he's really attempting to depict music. Did anyone have a, a the role narration in the third act of Tannhäuser is usually considered to be that. Uh, but you could say he fist is um a little bit also. Yeah. Um, where it really follows, but the, the, Rome, the Rome narration does so more continuously. That would, was, but the Fistus Ulm is, is really the, the first Wagnerian monologue. I mean, that, that's when, that's when the, the Dutchman comes off his boat and says, you know, the time is up, and now it's night, and he basically tells a story. Um, it's, by the way, not insignificant. This is anticipating my, one of my, my Siegfried talk in two years. Um, that, um, for, that in both cases, in the Rome narration and in, and in the Dutchman's, that Wagner's first attempts at creating a music that really just freely follows the words, that the music absolutely follows the words of the characters emotionally, comes in scenes when they're telling stories, narration scenes. The narration scenes are the parts of uh, Wagner that are the most often complained about yeah. by, it, um, um, I was gonna say idiotic, but that's probably not, <laughs> not, not, not really fair, by ignorant uh, um, outsiders. Uh, but actually, they're the heart of Wagner's uh, uh, works. Uh, Wagner's works are more about people telling stories than they are about people doing things, um, or explaining themselves, or explaining their predicament. I mean, that has, there's, that has its roots in a lot of other things as well, but it is no scenes very often where Wagner does his most advanced um, uh, techniques. And that's true in The Ring as well. But um, certainly, right off the bat, right in the very first scene between Albrecht and, and the Rhine Maidens, as, as, as tomorrow, as we listen, you'll see that at everything they say, the Rhine Maidens, the music will go from them teasing him to them, try, them, them seducing him, them being cruel to him. I mean, it follows every, even right away in the first scene. Even though we have the, you know, the, the, the water going on all the time, the little bits of change of harmonies and change of the little uh, uh, melodic fragments they sing still follow all the time this emotional content. Sometimes it does so very dramatic ways in the ring when something happens this way, such surprises somebody. Like for instance, when um, it becomes very apparent to, Z to Zieglinda who Siegmund is, <clears throat> or things like that. And other times it's more subtle. But nevertheless, uh, it's, it's, it's a constant feature of the music of the ring, that it describes really exactly the emotional state, really kind of word by word of the people. Um, and that, that's, the, the difference between two and three um, is subtle. In other words, description of content of character's speech, description of character's thoughts or feelings. And actually, again, we could go to the first scene of um, Rheingold. There's a big difference between what the Rhine maidens say to Alberich and what they're thinking about Alberich. It's very clear from lots of things in the music all the time that the Rhine maidens are, are not interested in in Albrecht, <laughs> that they're not really seriously considering uh, uh, being his darling, as, as one of them says. 
Uh, um, the, the words will be full of blandishments and seductions and things, but behind the words, we also feel in the music, their mockery, and they're, 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 they're toying with him. And, and, and this is an extremely important aspect. Um, There's so many examples, it almost is a shame to give them, but um, of, of Wagner's whole premise in Music in the Ring, that not only does the music describe what the characters are saying, but it describes what the characters are feeling. Very often the characters are not saying what they feel. Mm -hmm. um, in Rheingold, if we stick with Rheingold for a second, one character who, uh, whose feelings are, uh, who, well, who's not telling lies or being hypocritical, but is very often talking with very definite uh, and intent away from his words, and we hear both the intent and the words, is Loga. Practically at every moment of his speech, we hear that. Uh, a, a, a character, on the other hand, where his intent and his words are almost always the same, is, is Alberich. Alberich, whatever else he is, he basically says what he thinks. Um, it's very, you know, um, what, he, what, he, what he says is sometimes really ghastly, really horrible, but nevertheless he says it, and the music portrays it very, very, uh, very clearly. Um, many, many, many examples of that. But so we have this, this, this dichotomy, and this is something that music can do um, quite uniquely. Um, an, an actor, a good actor can certainly express easily, I think, and must express easily with the changing of the words, the changing of his uh, emotional content of the words themselves. Uh, um, by the, by his, not just by his gestures, but by the inflection of the words, by everything. But it's much more difficult for that actor to show us what his inner feelings are about what he's saying, especially when they're at odds with what he's saying, or they're in contrast with what he's saying. Or they have this, 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 which, and yet all of us, all the time, especially in, in, in something intensely dramatic or intensely significant like the story of the ring, um, what people say is not always what people think. Or um, what they think is, is complementary to what they say, but nevertheless quite distinct from it. Uh, um, even in the simplest moments of the ring, when, when we have the closest to dry recitative, by, by dry recitative, what he mean, meant is just that there's almost no music and it's just the words. Which, um, there are still bits of it in Rheingold, certainly. Um, not dry recitative, because it's like the company. But, and then practically, uh, Votan's, the first part of Votan's monologue is very close to dry recitative. Mm -hmm. Magnificent dry recitative. Some of the greatest anyone ever wrote, which is ironic, written by someone whose one of his great plans was to banish it forever. From it. It's just like the, the quintet for Meistersinger may well be the greatest ensemble ever written by the composer who was going to banish ensembles for music, okay. um, etc. But this is this this is this is the way of genius, I guess. Um, but nevertheless, this 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 use of the music as a means to show not only. The, the, the colorations of what they're saying, but the colorations of what they're feeling. And uh, this is a wonderful way sometime to listen very carefully to Wotan's monologue and follow the words and see how the words more or less follow his mood as he's sort of ruminating over what his life has been. But you see these little points when you can see uh, um, flickers of, of love and remembrance or of hope and remembrance or of disappointment and remembrance, or frustration and remembrance. It's all in remembrance, of course, because he's remembering what he's done. And, and, and the, these little flickers add an enormous amount of life in what could otherwise be a, a, a very boring passage, which is not if it's done well. Um, uh, and it's done, you see, it has to be done well as an actor. It has to be done especially well by an acting musician, a musician who can, who's aware of and can bring out these very subtle little things. So this is a very, very important part of the function of music in, in the ring. Okay, so now we finish uh, B, description of stage action. Okay, this, the, C is, is in a way one of the hardest, although it's extremely important. And a description of the essence of objects, characters, concepts, symbols, etc. Um, you know, could be said about this passage and passages like it. But one thing is absolutely unquestionable, because we all hear it, 
And, we, and you, you can put all kinds of mechanisms that would try to make you not hear it, perhaps, but you nevertheless hear it, is that this is noble, grand, majestic music. Now, it, I could not tell you why it sounds noble, grand, and majestic. I could give you elements, you know, the use of the Wagner tubas in a very new and, and, and uh, completely new instrument invented and has this very special sound and the harmonic content and the, just the whole sound of it and uh, everything about it. But the effect is, I think, I, I can't, uh, uh, I'm not, Derek Cook is interested in how music does this. I'm not, I don't know how. But I think that every one of us in this room hears this music as majestic. The character attached to this music has something noble and majestic about him. Whatever else he is and has, he has this. Now, there's, other, there's a whole other aspect of this music which is a subtext, um, and which makes the, the majesty of this music more dramatically complex, and actually, um, I think, much more, much deeper. Um, for instance, if I play another, this is another basic essence thing. What would we say about the essence of that music? Forget for a second what it is, just the essence of what, what does that music sound like? I mean, it sounds sort of, stressful. what? Stressful. Stressful, yes, and, and unresolved. It do, it, it's based on a harmonic situation that doesn't tell us anything, doesn't lead us anywhere. It sort of seems unresolved and, and, and wandering. Um, it, it certainly, you know, we can add lots of other words, but it's, it's, stressful is a good word, and unresolved, unfixed, unsettled. And now, the fact that it, th this, turns out to be a transformation of the other one, um, which Wagner very, very explicitly shows us, is, adds a whole other element to it. But we have to use as our starting point, and musicologists, I think, very often forget as a starting point, and so do stage directors sometimes forget as a starting point, that one of these, one of these musics by its essence is, at least as we mostly hear it, very unsettled, stressful, restless. Now, we happen to know it's associated with the ring, so all of that, you know, sort of adds to that. But forget about what it's associated with, just how it sounds. The other, which happens to be associated with Valhalla, sounds noble and majestic. Now, it's very closely related, but it's noble and majestic. And it is noble and majestic. Whatever else we can say, it is noble and majestic. Obviously, Wagner is saying a lot more about it. If it grows directly out of the ring, he seems to be saying, well, we know what he seems to be saying. But nevertheless, the character of the music is what it is. There's um, a great, for instance, I mean, now, as it happens, when we hear this motive, we have no idea what it means. I mean, we do because we know the ring, but, but if we were hearing it for the first time with no other indication, there's no outside indication. This is the, the, the score says, Wagner, uh, Wotan, as if suddenly struck by a great idea or great thought. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure how an actor does that, but that's what that music is supposed to represent, is this great thing. But we hear that. You, it certainly sounds pregnant and, and powerful, and uh, uh, but it, 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 words are very poor at, at describing, but this has very much an essence of its own, uh, uh, undeniably. Um, in a completely different kind of way, very related music with very different essence. essence, but it seems very sort of, the, the, the accompaniment figure helps a lot. But even just in itself, it seems pure. It is pure, harmonically, perhaps, part of the reason. Uh, um, but in any case, these things have essences which are clear. Now, there's a lot of times when um, I think that we can be very confused by the way the essence of the music seems in itself. Traditionally, 
And then we hear it twice again. It's pretty much verbatim. We hear it in the prelude um, of, um, of Act Two. You know, the, the, the nightmare scene between Hagen and, and Aldrich. We hear it again very beautifully, actually. Beautiful trumpet solo. Um, trumpet, which is usually in the ring a, a sort of a magnificent interest. I mean, we associate the sword mode with the trumpet. I'm not interested in talking about what, what this music means or doesn't mean or if it means anything at all, but just about what, what its character is and how, how this can be quite a tricky business. Because I think if we heard that, it, if anything, it sounds almost uh, maybe kind of noble, troubled, but noble. It has a kind of radiance in its sound, especially when you hear it with the orchestra because the trumpet solo. Um, now, the context is in both cases, we, it's Hagen singing it. It's associated very much with Hagen. Actually, when he, when he sings it the first time, he's saying, you, fr you fry, you fr your fly is on it, Zerna. You, you free sons, lovers of liberty, may you, you know, go down to perdition. Uh, uh, um, it's, it's kind of bad, I mean, it's what he, and yet, and yet, what I'm saying is the music by itself, the essence of the music doesn't, wouldn't necessarily tell us that. Um, so the, the, the essence of what music sounds like in the ring, in any music, but certainly in the ring, is sometimes a very double-edged sword. So it could be very, but, but, but it's very important to keep it in mind. It's, you know, we get, so this is another, we get so caught up in motives, light motives, and what the light motive means, that we sometimes forget to hear actually what the music sounds like. And the music sometimes has an essence of its own, which, is, which would at least seem to contradict what we quote unquote know that the music means. It's like, is it uh, clear? And, and, and sometimes the most important symbols in the ring um, actually would be very difficult for us to say what their essence is, what they sound like. If I play just this. Certainly sounds sadder than the other, but they're they're so neutral. That even this sounds kind of bossy. I maybe I'm maybe I'm conditioned by the fact that what I know I know what it means, but it's pretty. It's again, it's pretty basic. Pretty so. Um, the, 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 but it is very very important. Not in cases like that where I'm not sure, but in cases like with the Bahala, um, to recognize that music. Does the, Wagner does give some of the music a very strong sort of essential quality that can, can be very hard to define, but which is nevertheless very much there. Um, now, the second part of this, I've already actually anticipated, dynamic developments and metamorphoses of the concept or symbol which the object embodies. In other words, if you take, okay, Wagner in the first scene of Das Reinhold, the end of the first scene of Gus Reinhold probably does as great and powerful an example of modulation of, of evolution, metamorphosis of an idea to change its dramatic meaning as he ever will in the ring. And, and it has extremely powerful, lasting effects on us. It's been entirely cut out of the score. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you know, we, we've heard this music first like this. Softer. The edges are softer. Everybody hear that? And then the next time we hear it, softer still. And the orchestration is getting softer and softer. But harmonically, by softer I mean it's less jarring, it's less unsettling, it's less stressful, as you said. And then we hear this finally, this time in the horns. So the very sort of radiant sound.
because he's taking this. And he's forced us to hear this evolution of the material. Now, I, it's not that, that one is the same as the other, I'm not saying that for a second, but one definitely grows out of the other, out of something which starts off as being very settling and stressful, and perhaps even sinister, grows into something very majestic. This kind of metamorphosis, of course, is extremely powerful musically. It's powerful just as a sound thing, just as if we had no associations with the music, if we're just listening to this spectrum of sound as he's transforming something from something uh, into something else, just sound-wise, as it's constant uh, sort of, um, each time it's like he's put a different screen over the light and the light has come out in a, in a different color each time until the last time it comes out in this very splendid, majestic uh, D-flat major uh, uh, theme in the, with, in the, with the Wagner tubas. Um, and of course also there is a very deep symbolic content because it just happens that the music the, the, has been already very deeply associated to us with, with the ring, with this ring that he's going to make that's all, all powerful. And then we hear this... It, theoretically, the curtain rises and we see the hollow and we hear this. Mm. Um, so it's a, it's you can't and you're not you, and you're never supposed to forget this either. This is this 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 experience is central to listening to the music of the ring. Mm. So the, it's not just the power of the music's character, but the way that the character of the music can be transformed. Um, a very I mean, there, there are more examples of this than I could possibly. There's every page. One of the most powerful um, examples of this is. If we, climactic moment at the end of, uh, of, of Die Valkyra. Um, now, again, it's, 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 that's an awfully beautiful place just in itself, but what really uh, gives it so much of its beauty and so much of its power and so much of its dramatic power is that it is a metamorphosis. We feel the experience. And, and, and I think there's something very important to, to say, it's a good place to say it, which is that um, Wagner does not expect the listener to be a professional musician or an, uh, 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 able to make a musical analysis, or even to know names for the motives or any of these things. He doesn't, that's, that's, he believes, and all great composers, especially great composers of the Germanic tradition, believe that subliminally, on some level, the listener gets it, understands it, understands it perhaps to different degrees and to different levels of, of sophistication and to, to a different degree of, of actual verbal significance to be able to say what he gets. But that all listeners who are responsive and willing uh, um, get it, get basically this thing. And, and so that even if someone is not intellectually aware of the, 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 the metamorphosis, Nevertheless, on some level, Wagner's convinced that any listener that's really a true listener is aware, or a true watcher is aware of these things. That, that um, this is one of the basic differences, and one of the basic um, both problems and yet also uh, um, compliments that makes music drama um, difficult and yet so also wonderful. Because this kind of completely subliminal understanding is by its very nature much more musical than it is dramatic. It's not, of course, it's also dramatic. We understand many things dramatically without knowing that we understand them or without being able to um, rational, rationally or objectively to quantify them, to s explain them, to, 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 to limb the whole thing out. Um, and that's very much true in, 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 in great theater. I was thinking about Hamlet. It certainly has lots of things that I don't think that we necessarily understand exactly, but we, they certainly get to us anyway. But this is really the currency of music. This is music deals in this a great deal in this kind of subliminal understanding, that we understand things, hear things, feel things that, um, that we don't know. I mean, this is anticipating by, by four years now, three years, I guess. Um, but of course, when Wagner, as uh, the, the one thing he changes in the text, of course, is, is, is changing the text of the, of the final scene of the immolation scene. And, and he cuts, eventually. He makes several versions of, of a very important place 
sort of a summing up, revealed a summing up. And finally, he cuts it entirely and lets the music do it. He says that. He says the music says it better than words can. Mm -hmm. So there are certain kinds of things that Wagner, and I think that Wagner would have, he wouldn't have ever put it in the essays, opera and drama. But I think he would have recognized it and, and freely recognized it, even in 1850, that there are certain things that words do better than music, expressing con concrete ideas, far better. And certain things that music does better than words. Uh, um, getting across these kind of cognitive understandings that are not easily put into words, or maybe not possibly to be put into words. And so the idea, to some extent, of, of the music in the ring is to, to, is to fulfill that aspect of, of the music drama, is to, to, to work in tandem with the words to fulfill this. The, the Words can certainly express emotion, and music can enhance that expression of emotion. But there are certain things that words cannot express that music can express. And Wagner did write that, actually, in music and drama, talking about, he said that, that already in, in the, the, the finale of Act Two of Figaro, and then Beethoven shows us that there are um, emotional situations that words cannot express that music does much better. Okay, so let's, let's go on now to part two. So part one is all basically descriptive. Part two is recognition association. Now look, I can't, recognition association, of course, we're really getting into light motives here. But let's pretend like that we don't know the light motives exist. And, we're just, and, and, just, and just think of it, one of the things that um, the music in the ring does is, is that it creates volume and time. Now, um, all musical form deals with time. Musical form is based really in, strictly in time. It, it is a way of relating points in time. Music exists in time, music fills up time. That's what music is, it's a way of filling up time. And, um, and the musical form, it could be very short, it could be... That's a satisfactory melody because we hear this and we remember it. This first time it goes up, we hear it again, and now it goes down. So it's satisfactory. It, it sort of posits a situation, it takes one possible solution, posits again, and, 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 and finds another more definitive solution. So that's, that's an example of musical form. It happens to be over 10 seconds. But musical forms do the same kind of thing traditionally over 15 or 20 minutes of a, of a movement. And later on, perhaps, in, in, in symphonies that are cyclical, they might even do it over 30 or 40 minutes. Well, Wagner in the Ring does it over 15 hours. But basically, but, but forgetting entirely, without necessarily reference to light motives per se, the, 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 the remembering one moment from another moment. We hear something and we remember it. Of course, um, there are, in almost every moment in the ring, as a matter of fact, Wagner's attention was that essentially after the first scene, at every moment in the ring, practically, we are um, remembering. One of the things that Rheingold does do, and why it's, uh, among other reasons, why it's a prologue, why it's a, 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 a prologue to the, the rest of the, uh, the, the ring, is that so much of Rheingold is sort of setting up things for us to remember. It's sort of laying out the material. It already has some of it itself. I mean, um, uh, the first place where we really remember a lot of things is Loga's monologue. Loga comes in and tells, I've been around the world and no one was willing to give up love, um, except, <laughs> except this guy Alberich, and all of a sudden we are flooded with reminiscences of music that we've heard in the first scene. We hear all this stuff, we hear the rhyme names, we hear, now it's changed. It doesn't sound the same anymore. Um, um, Part of that is just by the very nature of remembering things don't sound the same anymore. But 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 one of the great functions that music can do is is that it can make us remember because we 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 recognize the music and we recognize sometimes the very specific place. Now there are very different kinds of of uses of music that way. I think I've actually sometimes yes right. Sometimes it can be very specific. For instance, any time in the ring, any time. Any time we hear. That phrase, we, we remember a specific moment in the ring, which is, you know, when Vogelinda sings that. Just, you know, who, only he who forswears love, only he who curses love can take the gold and turn it into a ring. So we, we remember her, what she says, and what it means. That's an absolute reminiscence moment. And we actually only hear it a few times during the course of the ring. It doesn't really change very much. It doesn't undergo a whole lot of thing. We hear it, for instance, um, 
We, when Zygmunt is going to pour, pull the sword, that's the big mystery moment. Yes, we'll talk about that. We'll get to Valkyrie, but we hear it. We hear it at the end of that scene in, in, in remembrance that it's been done. We hear it obliquely kind of referred to by Logan, but not very clearly. And then we hear it when Zygmunt is, pulls the sword out of the tree, just before he pulls the sword out of the tree. And probably the single most um, complexly, let's say, or a problematic uh, a moment in the ring. But I'm not talking about what things mean now. I'm not talking about light motives. I'm just saying what we remember. When, when he's getting ready to pull the sword out of the tree, he quotes the same music that Vogelinda sings with the same orchestration and the same key, exactly the same. We remember it. We remember it again when Wotan is just getting ready to kiss Brunhilde to sleep. Now, now it's in a different key, but we still remember it. And then we'll be back. We only hear it one more time, really. We hear it when Brunhilde refuses to give up the ring. When, when, uh, with Valtraut. Valtraut is trying to get her to give up the ring, and, Vot and Brunhilde says, and... It's all very passionate in this kind of thing. It's the same music, same key, very much the same orchestration. Uh, uh, and we remember. Now, what these moments mean are very different. And, and it's one of the reasons why leitmotiv sometimes is a, is a problem and a concept. But for the, for the moment, I'm not worried about what it means. I'm just saying that we remember. And, and, I, and, that, and that's, the per, that's one of the purposes, is that we remember. Now, there are many more complex things. There are lots of things that most things in the ring, every time we hear them, they're a little different. And, and, and there, um, the, 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 uh, the structural, the musical value of that is very, very uh, uh, significant because it's the same, but it's different. So we recognize the similarity between the two places, but we also recognize change. How can you live change in a musical form? You can live change in a dramatic form because characters you know, are children in scene one, adolescents in scene two, adults in act two, and, and, and old fogies in act three. I mean, you can, you can do physical things. How does music do that? How does music express change? Music expresses change by returning in, in new ways. So that we remember what it was before, we say, oh, it's different now. And, and the ring has so many examples of that, I mean, that it does it all the time. That's one of the main things that the music does in the ring, is it makes us live and experience the passage of time in a very uh, dynamic and powerful and dramatic way by constantly re referring us to, we heard this before, then it sounded like this, now it sounds like that. It could be something very, very obvious. When Siegfried, in the, at the beginning of Gunnar Damron, comes out of um, the cave, you know, Brunhilde's cave, we hear... Almost anybody can recognize it as the same music. Well, it's certainly, it's, it's, it sounds very different. From, and it's going to sound even different again when in Secret Shula March, it was very, very loud, very, very grand. Um, that, that's an extremely obvious and extreme uh, example of this. But smaller examples of this occur on every single page. It would be almost impossible to, after. From from Valkyrie on, but even to a large extent after the first scene of Rhinegold, to take any single line of music in the ring where there's not some reminiscence of some other previous point, and and, and among other things, what it does is it also it defines the passage of time. It does a lot of other things, but for now, I would like to emphasize that. Um, and, and then the second part, the development of associations with the remembered event. That's exactly what I'm talking about. We follow the meaning of the event as it goes. So in other words, not only do we remember the event, we remember when we first heard it, or when we second heard it, or third heard it, but we live the, the, uh, the evolution, the passage, the change, the growth the, the, uh, of the, uh, as we've heard it. We don't consciously remember each time. We can, couldn't make a list. I mean, even I couldn't make a list of every time we hear some, some very important music in the ring. I mean, it might be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. How many times do we hear the ring music in the ring? How many times do we hear the Valhalla music in the ring? Not as many, but still many times. Um, and yet every time, it's a little different, and it's, a little, it's another step in this long evolution, which really goes from the beginning to the end. So that's a, that's a very important function of music in the ring. The B part is a very interesting one, and one that Wagner pays a lot of attention to, this word on, um, which I've translated here as anticipation, prophecy. Presentiment would be another word. Anu is, anen in German means to 
sort of sense, to feel, almost like instinct. Um, and what it, this is, is that music which, not, this is exactly the opposite of remembering. It's music which is predicting, predicting something which is going to happen. The most famous example of this in the ring, of course, is when Wotan is struck by his great idea. You know, if you hear this. We all know that's the sword mode, but at the time he has the great idea, if we didn't know the ring, we'd never know that was, had anything to do with the sword. But actually, Wagner supposedly toyed with the idea of having him pick up a sword that the giants had accidentally left from the That's what has happened in the performance tradition for about 50 years, right way through years. Yeah, 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 I know, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a terrible idea, of course. Yes, it's a terrible idea. It, it really kind of undoes un something. But this is Wagner. Now, these moments, a very interesting lecture, uh, one that um, I don't have time to do, but maybe we could do it sometime in the future, is to show it becomes almost like a game. An extraordinarily large amount of the music in the ring is heard before we recognize it. Um, um, I, I'm going to give you a couple of examples now. So it'll be sort of a, of a force visa of, of something that maybe we can have a real talk on later. In other words, um, Wagner is almost artificially creating a situation that the first time we hear something, it's not really the first time that we've already heard it. And now why would he do that? Why would, why would he build up this? And, and he writes a lot about this function of music as being able to predict things that are going to happen. Why would, why would he do that? Well, I think one reason he does it is that because it goes back to this <clears throat> subliminal thing that we were talking about, the powerful of music. It means that when we hear something, the first time that it really means something, it's part of us who says, I know what that is. I've heard that before. And so it sort of has already weight, substance. It exists in time. It has volume in time. It, it, even though we couldn't possibly say. And, and, and now there are many more examples of it uh, that are almost as powerful as this one. One very powerful one. To my mind, the most powerful single moment in Das Rheingold, and one that uh, Derek Cook uh, speaks about very well in, uh, in, in, in his guide to uh, uh, the Schulte Ring, you know, the, the record set from the guide to the Schulte Ring. Unfortunately, pages are completely missing from the score. Missing 15 pages from the score. I see I cut out a lot of pages. Anyway, I know this one by memory, pretty much. But, you know, and they're going down to Nibelheim, and the music starts. <laughs> The most typical of the ring and the most untypical of Rheingold, because there's a lot going on. He's, he's really developing a lot of material we've heard before. Um, but the thing I really want to point out is that this which comes very much to the climax of it. It's played very loudly by very powerful instruments. And, the, and at the end of the scene, when they're going up, we hear the, the tinkle of the, of the uh, anvils, and then they're interrupted by reprisal. The listener can't possibly know what this music means if we're talking now about light motives and symbols of music at this point. Um, now, of course, if we think about it, of course, this is the same music as. This happens to be the minor key. And Wotan will sing an absolute quotation of both of these passages, just reversing the keys at the beginning and the end of his monologue in Act Two of Valkyra. But that's way in the future. Um, um, and, and Derek Cook's point is, is that he, what he said when we listen to Valkyra, we should remember the, the Nibelheim scene and say, Wotan is, is now reaping what he sowed. Um, but nevertheless, the power of that music as it comes out is sort of baleful and tragic and, and, and uh, tragic. I mean, it sounds painful, tragic, uh, is, is also powerful because, of course, part before, the fast part, the cellos and stuff that leads up to it, is all the same music. And, and it was, it was, so was that, you know, when Freya first comes in here. We've actually heard it before. We heard it when Alberic says, when Alberic has been rejected by all three of them in the very first scene, he says, the, 
the, the third, so beautiful, has rejected me too. He sings those, those exact notes. To... So we've heard all this before. So, so when we hear this, it's an uh, anticipation, an anum, of, of, of the whole love music in Act Two of, of, of Valkyra, which it's not yet. But it's also been forecast itself. It, it, so even so, the anum has an anum of its own. The, the presentiment has already been, and this is very typical of the ring. That and it's incredible to take almost any motive, especially the ones that first come in with great pregnancy, like something like the beginning of the scene with the photos for Kunigun saying that with Brunhilde and Zygmunt when she first comes in and announced that he's going to have to die. Uh, we hear that for the first time. It's a very every time that motive comes in the ring, practically everything stops. It's a very we've all been taught that's the fate motive, although I have no idea why, but. Um, I guess one name is as good as another, but what, what that again? We've we've already heard that. That's been, there's a that also is is, is has, there is a and, and and I there's just it's an amazing amount of music in the ring that has this these this, these moments of of anu, of, of preparation before. So this is a musical function. It obviously um, is one that deals very much on a peripheral or a subliminal level, but it's I think one that Wagner still considered to be very important. Okay. So now the, the third one. The third one is interesting because it sometimes very much overlaps the second one, although it doesn't necessarily. A Greek chorus. This is a function of the music. Um, this is where, okay, we were talking about the music expresses the emotions of what people are saying. The music expresses very often the emotions of what they're thinking, even when it's at odds with what they're saying. The music expresses the overall emotions of a scene or the physical characteristics of a scene. The, uh, like you know, the forest murmurs, or the or the or the or, or the rope in the Norn scene, or whatever. But this is an example of the music actually being outside the action of the players and the scene in which they're in, and it's commenting on it. That's what I mean by Greek chorus. That it's actually as if the music were outside the action for a second. It's not describing the feelings of any of the characters, but it's commenting on, on the on the action. It's either commenting on perhaps the characters. Uh, feelings or on the, uh, the the way the characters act. Can anybody just this kind of interesting to see if anybody comes up with one? Anybody think of a place in the ring where the music um, is, it serves as a kind of a Greek chorus? There's actually quite a few if you stop to think about it. And and okay, I'll give you an example to to, to, to sort of get you started. The one I just played, the one that I played as an example of Anu, of anticipation of the love motive in the minor key. It exists. It, once we know that. It is like a comment. It's like somebody on the outside commenting on this loveless world of, 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 of the Nibelheim scene. It starts it and it ends it. It sort of puts it on both sides. So it, it does function in a way like a Greek chorus. It's, it's not, Wotan doesn't know this, Logan doesn't know this, God knows, Alberich doesn't know it, none of the characters know it. It's not involved you know, directly, so it's something on the outside. It's in this case, maybe Wagner himself. But it's like a Greek chorus saying, look at this incredibly loveless world. Now, as it happens, this is particularly complex because there's no reason we would associate this music specifically with love at this point. We will later. But nevertheless, this is the very sound of the music that gives it this. And very often, when the music serves as a Greek chorus, it's, it's quite strong. Sometimes it can be very subtle. But anybody think of another example of music serving as a Greek chorus where it makes a comment from the outside? in a way, be the greatest and most important. And, and that's absolutely at the foundation of the whole story of the ring. That transformation of the ring music into the Valhalla music is absolutely fundamental to the ring. Uh, um, and that's, that's certainly a Greek chorus. The person making that, that assumption is, is Wagner, is outside the action. Certainly nobody in the... Um, and by the way, he even rubs it in further. I didn't say this, but what after we have this great first big initial statement of the Valhalla motive, we hear it very complete. And Wotan is lying there asleep. And then, you know, uh, Fricka says, wake up, husband, look, see what you've done. And he's still sleeping and dreaming. And he's dreaming about, uh, well, if, if I haven't torn out this page, I'll tell you what he says. He says, the sacred dwelling of joy is guarded by gate and door. Manhood's honor, might without bound, rise now to endless renown, to endless fame. So he's having a dream about being incredibly powerful, having limitless might, and that we've just heard transform from the spring music. But what is he dreaming at? He's dreaming to... He's dreaming to, back to the ring, 
re ring on him again. Then it transforms itself right back into the Valhalla. He doesn't repeat. He really wants us to get this connection. That's an example of a Greek chorus where, he's, where the chorus is being very insistent that we understand, that we understand this connection. It's, what's extraordinary to me is as insistent as he is, there seem to be actually a number of people who don't, don't get that connection. That's right. uh, um, and, and it's very interesting, too, because this is right at the beginning of the ring. It's, you know, and yet, in a certain kind of way, it's the greatest example in the ring of both the Greek chorus and of, of a motivic transformation. Um, uh, I, my, my composition teacher, uh, Roger Sessions, who was a great dodecaphonic 20th century composer, thought this was the most astonishing uh, musical motivic transformation uh, in history of music, actually. And, uh, um, you know, he was, really, he was really impressed with this, because, just, just as a feat of imagination, of, of compositional imagination, because it isn't obvious. And the, the point here is, too, is, is that they're not the same music. They're not, they're, if, from, if we, they just have the same shape and the same rhythm. But they're actually very different pieces of music with very different feelings. But Wagner has created a situation where we're forced to see that they are the same, even though they are very different. It's, they're, they're different in a way, like for instance, if I play. It's clearly different from. Very different music, but from a music as a musician, which you know, which I am, and, and I guess you aren't. I we're used to hearing this is the same music. We're it's very standard for us to hear this is the same music. Just you know, we we this is, for instance, as a musician, if I play from the Wallstein sonata, and then I play the second theme, I say that's the same music as this. That's not something that you would perhaps I'd have to kind of show you. But for us, it's automatic. We just hear that. But we don't hear it. I mean, you don't hear it automatically. You only hear it because Wagner creates a context in which you must hear it. And so that's, that's what's so extraordinary. And in a way, extraordinarily modern, actually. Extraordinarily um, contemporary. It's the kind of thing composers really only started doing sort of consciously after World War II, um, which is in itself a rather kind of amazing thing. It's not a part of the light motivic technique it was taken up by even Debussy, which is sort of the more, or Richard Strauss is more conventional, and Debussy who's less conventional, or, or Baird. Baird also uses it less conventionally. But it's actually, in a way, more sophisticated than anything they ever did, and yet he does it right at the beginning of the ring. But, okay, that's a great example of recourse. Anybody want to come up with another one? I yeah. in Albrecht here today with him. Certain, yeah, in a way you're right, in, the, in a sense. Uh, uh, there's certainly music in that scene which seems to come from outside. I would say, uh, I'm going to give one answer, and then maybe this will also uh, get you guys thinking about this. For instance, almost, okay. Well, this time it's not so much. Any, okay, in Act Two of Siegfried, when Siegfried kills um, Fafner, what do we hear? We hear. Siegfried comes on stage in Act One of Gooder Dameron, all this big, exciting music and this big, big, big you know, crescendo and final. Big cymbal crash. Bach and sings to it. You hear this, the, you know, the, uh, um, which, of course, is Albrecht's curse. Now, you know, there's no, nobody, nobody there is thinking about Albert's curse. Maybe Hagen is, I don't know. But it's not, certainly, it's not, the, it's not on the part of anybody of the stage action. There's no stage, it doesn't reflect the stage action. But it reflects, it's like a comment from the outside saying, look folks, here's, what's, here's, here's the results of Albert's curse, let's call it. Um, or of the ring, or whatever it is. It's reminding us of that. And we, we have it all the time, we get this. We get, in Gooder Dammering in particular, a lot of this, uh, not just with, 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 with the, the Albrecht's curse, but for instance, in, in Gooder Dammering, when um, um, Siegfried and Gunther swear blood brotherhood, they, they swear it, I mean, they have this, this thing. They, they sing this blood brotherhood thing, but they sing right for it. This motive all through it, the spirit, Wotan's spear motive through it. Now, what does Wotan's spear have to do with Siegfried and, and, and uh, Gunther's blood brotherhood? And then we'll hear it very prominently, extremely loud in, this, in the <coughs> wonderful interlude between the, that scene and then the Valtrap scene, um, which used to very often get cut, actually. 
um, it was cut in the ring, the, the Christian Flagstad ring from the Norway National Opera, that whole orchestral scene is cut. Um, anyway, but what, 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 what is it there for? Well, if it means anything at all, it, it's, it's, it's um, like a Greek chorus. And what that Greek chorus means, it could mean, for instance, something along the lines of, see, audience, that Siegfried, ironically, is getting himself entangled with agreements just as his grandfather did e eons ago. Um, there's no direct connection, and there's no, certainly the, the characters themselves are utterly un, uh, unaware of any possible connection, but the music is making a connection to us. The music is serving as a force outside the dramatic action to inform us, creating dramatic irony, or, or like a Greek chorus, which is commenting on the action from the outside. So the music does that a lot in the ring. Sometimes very, very sophisticatedly, as there at the beginning of, of um, uh, of Rheingold, sometimes much less. I mean, for instance, any time anytime anything really bad happens in the ring, we almost invariably hear the curse motive. This is something, something that some people actually make fun of. It usually works actually pretty well. But in any event, it is very much a, a Greek chorus. I mean, the only time it's not would be when Albrecht himself sings it, or when it's, there's a clear co connection. But usually, the, the people involved have no knowledge or awareness of Albrecht's curse. Siegfried, for instance, has never heard of it. Um, he, well, he's told about it, I guess, by, but he doesn't pay any attention to it. The dragon, um, the dragon does tell him that this ring is cursed, to flee the curse, but it uh, doesn't seem to make very much difference. Okay. And that, then I'm, now I'm on to, uh, uh, Roman numeral two, letter D, which is time connections or bridges over long distances. Uh, music structures. Now this I have talked about in, in terms of the fact that the music is always linking itself to times in the past each time. But this is a more specific kind of thing I'm thinking about, where one point in the music is specifically referring to some other point in the music a long time before. And actually, I already gave one of the best examples, that music from the Descent in Anibal Coming directly back in Wotan's monologue. When the same notes, it's precisely the same. It's exactly the same. It's a complete mirror image repeat. And among other things, what that does, is from a musical structural standpoint, it creates a, a fantastic sort of musical unity over a long period of time. And there are not so many places in the ring that do that, but there are a number. Um, some of them are really strict, well, I'm gonna talk about that in the last part. Some of them are very abstract, and those, that really doesn't belong to this part. But these are ones that are not so abstract. The, the most famous one, um, which, um, again, actually, um, um, Derek Cook describes in that little record uh, accompanying the Schulte Ring is how the music that becomes the immolation scene, the beginning of the immolation scene how that music has step by step evolved from its beginning, which is actually way, way back in scene two of Rheingold, when um, Fazel sings to Wotan, what you are, you are only through treaties. Um, you know, you, you have to obey your own laws to have any power at all, and the music is. Now, nobody in the world not even the most clever musicologist could possibly go from there to... I mean, they're utterly different, utterly different. But if you go, and when we do Good and I'll do it again. I've done it for you before in Good and and I'll do it again when we get back to Good and If you follow step by step through um, this, the episode in Rheingold, and then two episodes in Siegfried, and then three episodes in Act One of, of, of Good and Emmering, and then you arrive, it becomes a natural process. Now these are the kinds of things where you're not expected to remember. It's not, it's not like remembering something that you've actually heard before. But what it does do is it creates, from a sort of a musical structural standpoint, a fantastic sense of, of, of oneness, of organic unity, over the largest scope, from the, the last scene of Bitterdam to the second scene of Rheingold, with all these intermediate steps in between. And so, um, there are not a lot of examples of music doing this in the ring, but, but there are some. There, there are a couple of others, actually. And, and um, th this is one of the ways in which the ring, the music in the ring, holds the ring together. One of, obviously, Wagner has an enormous problem, an enormous challenge, unique challenge. Uh, 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 an opera, a uh, dramatic work, 
that is 15 hours long, that was written over a period of 26 years. And just imagine that even though the text never changes, Wagner's musical style changes, his, his relationship to his material changes. Actually, a very, very good essay by Boulez in one of the Bayreuth program books from the years that Boulez was conducting, in which he talks about one of the aspects of the ring which is so interesting and so unique is precisely to follow how Wagner's relationship to his own material changes. Not just, so when we listen to music in Gutter Dammerung that we've also heard in Rheingold, it's not just that we're remembering what it was like in Rheingold and how different it is in this new world of Gutter Dammerung, but it's also a new composer. It's quite a different composer who's writing with this material. He doesn't have the same relationship to this material anymore. And this has to do with the, also the nature of music because uh, he ha doesn't have the same relationship with uh, the ideas behind the words either. But the words remain the same. The words are the same. He doesn't change one iota the, the descriptions of the stage action, the descriptions of the sets, of what, he what people do. Um, all the, those are in the original text and they never get changed a bit. Now, what he thinks these things mean has perhaps changed quite a lot. But the music itself, the way he views his musical material, um, one of the things that Boulez talks about, which is a, a, a uniquely interesting thing about the music in the ring, is how, in some cases, music that we have not heard since Rheingold, or since way long before, comes back much, much later. And, and uh, uh, how different it is, how different Wagner treats it, how different Wagner looks at the same music. And one of the big questions that we all have about the ring that perhaps will never be answered uh, fully is how much when Wagner first thought of these things did he know what he was going to do with it? How much had he planned already? How much of it was, was as big a surprise to him as it was to us? We, we really don't know. But nevertheless it creates this very sort of dynamic relationship as the material is in constant evolution, not only sort of consciously but also unconsciously as he himself has changed in his relationship to it. Let's go now I'm just about done to the last part, the abstract or purely musical devices. Um, there's a lot of music in the ring, even though now this, there's not practically any in Rheingold, just a tiny bit, um, because he's trying to get away from this. One of the things that Wagner, was, which I just I told you earlier, that Wagner is trying to, not to do in his new music drama, one of the things that he says is wrong about music in um, previous operas, including Mozart's, is, is that they try to put the music into forms which exist as co co conventions which are not part of the drama. You know, having an aria that repeats um, stanzas. People don't talk in stanzas in real life. Or having, having it stop and have applause. People, in real life, people don't stop and have applause from the outside. It's not interrupted. All these things are conventions that, that, that Wagner is, is, is renounces. And, and is not going to do. Now, he doesn't entirely uh, uh, get rid of them. Already, in Rheingold, there's only one place I can think of where he has a little bit of something which I would consider to be a purely musical uh, uh, conceit, structurally, formally, and that's in uh, Loga's monologue. Very often, the places in the ring, just as I said the places in the ring, this is an interesting paradox, just as I said that the places in the ring that are very often the most advanced and have the most sort of revolutionary of Wagner's musical ideas are in the narrations. It's also true that very often the narrations are those that contain the, the most anachronisms, the most sort of formal uh, schematic, you understand what I mean by schematic? Structure, if I say schematic structure, does that mean anything? Should I define it? I'll define it. Okay, schematic structure is one that I could like plot on a graph. Like, you know, when I say sonata form, you could say first theme and second theme and coda. You could talk about it in terms of keys, or you could say, you know, exposition, development, and recapitulation and coda. You could, there's all sorts of ways. You can sort of plot it. It, it, it has a kind of plastic, uh, independent, uh, you could describe the way the music is organized in some kind of way which could be determined by some kind of a scheme, by a, by a kind of a plan. A, B, C, you know, A, B, C, B, A, or whatever, all those kinds of things are all schemes. Whereas in theory, in the ring, there can be no such structures of that sort. Because it's supposed to follow, the, the, the music is supposed to follow the drama. And, 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 and drama doesn't do that, or it doesn't do it exactly that. But the ring is actually full of places that have forms like that. But um, they're usually in limited ways. Now, there was a great um, musicologist, music theorist, uh, more music theorists than really musicologists of the 1920s and 30s who for a, quite a long time 
um, was considered to be the authority on Wagner, and, and his uh, writings were largely unchallenged, named Alfred Lawrence. Um, you have probably something of this. He wrote only in German, and none of his works, as far as I know, has been translated. Maybe. The, I don't think they were ever translated. He wrote a, a very, very detailed analyses of the Ring and Tristan, at least, and I think also Gutterdammerung and Parsifal, but I've never seen those. I, I have the Ring and, and, and Tristan. And um, he describes them in great, great detail as these gigantic forms uh, based on tonality, patterns of tonality, you, and utilizing the traditional German bar form, which is this AAB form, which is described in Meistersinger a great deal, um, which is sort of the traditional German song form. And it, it went, to him, what Wagner has done as a musical structure for his later works is to sort of organize them in this gigantic sort of Germanic uh, song form organized around keys. Um, and people basically took it very seriously uh, for a very long time. After the war, uh, he firstly uh, was pretty much discredited because he was also a very fervent Nazi. And um, uh, a lot of his works he talks about the, the, the mystical Germanic heart of the score, that it's a form that really can only be felt and understood by people who are pure of heart and have Aryan blood. Uh, <laughs> obviously things like that didn't stand him in good stead in 1950. Um, but besides which, the pr big problem with Lawrence is, is that his analyses in no way reflect what you hear. Uh, uh, I can't go into the details, this is, this is very sort of heady stuff, but um